We're in the book of Nahum tonight. You've probably never heard a sermon from Nahum. Maybe you have. It's not far after Jonah. If you can find Jonah, you can probably find Nahum. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So it's right at the end of your Old Testament there. Last week we looked at Jonah. Now Jonah is very famous. Uh, even people who don't know about the Bible have heard of Jonah and the whale and that kind of thing. And this is about the same city. Nahum uh, preaches to Nineveh, but in a different way. It's, uh, it's about 150 years later. Jonah preached revival, and man, they had a revival in Nineveh. Some people think it was probably the world's greatest revival because everybody repented, the whole city. Um, there's been great revivals around the world at different times. Uh, England had revivals many years ago. And some people think it spared them what France went through with their, their great overthrow and killing of people. Uh, America's had some revivals with uh, Moody and, and different ones. But you know, you add 150 years to a revival and uh, people can be anywhere. You know, that'd be a, quite a few generations and a lot of changes. So while Jonah preached revival, Nahum preached ruin. Uh, you'll see it, it's very different. Uh, to me, the theme is pretty much Galatians 6, 7, where the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That, that's pretty much the theme of, of Nahum. Uh, Nineveh has turned away from God now, and they're, they're back to their wickedness, and uh, they're going to receive uh, what they've been, they've been sowing. And so Nahum has a message of judgment and destruction to Nineveh, and you'll see as well a message of comfort to Judah. Because Nineveh is the, was the capital of Assyria. You're probably in reading your Old Testament, you've heard of them, the Assyrians. You know, they would uh, descend upon Israel and, and attack them. And uh, they're very vicious people. Uh, so with Nineveh and Assyria being overthrown to Israel, they think, oh, great. You know, in fact, most of the people around there would have said, great. If you want to read some things about it, look in 2 Kings chapter 19, not right now, but um, it's a time when Assyria surrounds Jerusalem. They have a siege set, and uh, God says, don't worry about it. <laughs> and he, he sends them home, and, and it says the angel of the Lord kills about 160,000 of them or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, Isaiah 36 and 37, I think, is the same, uh, same situation. It was the capital of Assyria. Nowadays, it would be modern Iraq. You might have heard of a town called Mosul, M-O-S-U-L. It's on a river there. Uh, it would have been across the river from where Mosul is now. So let's read Nahum chapter 1. I'll just read a few verses. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. We'll just stop reading there for the moment. The first chapter is pretty much just pronouncing Nineveh's doom. And the difference between, one of the differences between Nahum and Jonah is that Jonah went and preached and they got the opportunity to repent. God says, you've had your chance, this is it. And he just, he's just telling them, uh, this is what's going to happen. And one of the things you see as, as you begin to look at Nahum chapter 1 are some, some wonderful things about God. There's some real characteristics of, of God here. One of them you, we don't always think of as a good thing, but it is a good thing when it comes to God. God is jealous. Now, what that means is if you belong to the Lord, he won't let anybody else have you. <laughs> you know, we, we sometimes think of jealous as being bad, but listen, if there's a, a relationship that you have, you should be jealous of it. You know, you should care about it. And uh, he demands exclusive devotion is, is really what that has to do with. And it talks about his vengeance. You know, because he cares, uh, when people mess around with, with his word and with his people, uh, like Romans 12 quotes, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And that's his place. 
You know, we, we kind of excuse sin, and we get used to sin. Here's a, here's a statement that God makes. It says, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's Psalm 711. I remember that because of the store. <laughs> uh, God is angry with the wicked every day. He, he, he never overlooks sin. He, he never thinks, oh, well, I won't worry about it. God is angry with the wicked every day. And, you know, he's, uh, he's slow to anger, like he says in verse 3. He's given Nineveh years. You, you know, before he sent Jonah, they'd had hundreds of years that they could have repented. And finally, when he sends Jonah, they do. Well, now, 150 years later, they're, they're back to where they were. And, you know, God is very, very patient, but he's jealous. He's long-suffering, is what he's saying there in, in verse 3. But he's also powerful, great in power. And he must judge sin. It says there, and will not at all acquit the wicked. You hear that word acquit, you know, in, in court and, and that kind of thing. It means to leave unpunished. You know, someone's guilty, but they're acquitted. Not enough evidence or something. Uh, God says he will not at all acquit the wicked. Uh, God is just. He's long-suffering, but there comes a time when he says, that's it. And he uses some of the things he talks about here. Sometimes God uses nature to judge us. You know, in Romans, it talks about the, how the whole world groans under the curse of sin. You know, a lot of the times the things that are going on, God's allowing those to happen because of our sin. Uh, there in, in verse uh, 3, it talked about the wind and the storm. And, uh, verse 4, he rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. You know, droughts, Bashan languishes and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yeah, the world and all that dwell therein. You know, there's things that happen to our earth. And he, he's talking about, you know, the fact that's, that's God's judgment. And uh, we need to under, understand that he can't, he can't just do nothing about evil. That's why Jesus came, was to give us the opportunity uh, to be forgiven. Verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. You know, this description of God, this is not the general thing you hear. You know, people kind of portray God as this silly old man or, you know, something like that. Uh, God is, is, is fierce. God can be, is, is furious with sin. And, you know, the Bible says when, when Jesus comes again, uh, people are just, you, they're not going to be uh, messing around with him. He's, uh, he's going to be a, an amazing sight. And, you know, as you see this, how he responds to uh, to Nineveh, his justice, it's that very character is why we can trust his goodness. You know, knowing that God deals with sin, we know that he's also true in every other area. You know, his mercy and his grace and his kindness and all of those other things. Uh, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And as he, as he talks about these two different areas, his justice and his goodness, uh, Nineveh is going to be experiencing his justice. Well, Judah will too, but uh, by him uh, dealing with Nineveh, Judah is going to have some, some blessing. They're not going to have them attacking them and, and so on. In uh, verse 8, he says, But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. God is telling them, this is not a temporary thing, this is... This is the end. Verse 9, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. What he's saying to them there is, whatever you want to try, it's not going to work. <laughs> whatever you imagine you think how you're going to get out of this, uh, he's going to make an utter end. Uh, this, there's not going to be a, a second chance on this. In fact, verse 14, he says, The Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. At the end of the verse, I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. God is, is finished with Nineveh, and uh, they're going to be, be set aside. It's an interesting verse, uh, verse 12 there. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down. For many years, people didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah, there's things in the Bible, people read it, great scholars and everything, they look at it, and 
you know, they try and figure it out, and they, oh, it might mean this, and it might mean that, and they weren't sure what that meant until about 1850, they rediscovered Nineveh, and they excavated it, and they found documents, you know, however they did documents in their stone or whatever, and they found that this was an Assyrian legal term. And what it has to do with uh, is many joined together as one, kind of like a corporation or something. And he, what he's saying to them, you can, you can get as many people to stand up against God as you want, and it won't make a bit of difference. <laughs> though, though they be quiet, though they join together, likewise many, yet shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Um, Proverbs talks, talks about that. Though hand join in hand, uh, you know, rebellion against God. That's the advantage of a literal translation. Sometimes there's things that the translators don't really know what it means. So if they try and translate what they think it means, they don't know. <laughs> but if they'll translate it literally, like the King James, later on they'll say, oh, that's what that means. There's more than one place like that where it, they discover something and say, oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that's why we use the King James Bible. And this just seemed, the very idea that Nineveh would be gone, that Assyria would be gone, just seemed impossible to Israel. Um, you know, if you look back in history, you'd be amazed what nations used to be world powers. You know, Portugal, Spain, um, Holland. You know, there's, there's been countries that were really powerful. And now they're just little countries, you know. And if, if the Lord tarries, it'll be the same with the United States. People say, they used to be a world power, and they can't do anything. <laughs> um, the Aztecs and the Mayans were some of the most civilized people in the world. And now those, those are the people who people wonder if, if they came from cavemen, because <laughs> you know, they're so backward. Um, we need to under, understand that God sets up and God puts down. They, Jews couldn't imagine that God was able to put Assyria aside and Nineveh would be taken care of. And verse 15 is a real um, hope to Judah. He says, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee, he's utterly cut off. So there's some hope for, for Israel. That, that's repeated in Isaiah 52. You're probably familiar that he says it again in Romans 10, when he talks about being a witness for the Lord. Uh, you know how beautiful are the feet of them, that, uh, just as he, as he says there. So in chapter 1, you see a lot about God's justice and his goodness. Justice for Assyria, Nineveh, uh, goodness for the Jews. Chapter 2 is basically just Nineveh's destruction. I'm not going to read a lot of it. He, he more or less describes it. Uh, the first eight verses are the siege of Nineveh. And then the last um, five or so verses are um, the sack of Nineveh. In uh, verse 6 of chapter 2, it says, The gates of the rivers shall be opened and the palace shall be dissolved. There's a historian, a Greek historian named, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I think it's Theseus. He records that Babylon invaded Nineveh when a flood washed away part of the foundation and the gates of the city. Exactly, exactly what God said here. Similar to verse 8 of chapter 1. With an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. That's what he's talking about, uh, even before it happened. Um, in verse 13 of chapter 2, he says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard. He's just saying, uh, that's it for Nineveh. Then chapter 3 is basically... Uh, you might say, why Nineveh's doom was deserved. And, you know, as you, as you look at this, you, you need to remember God deals with individuals, but he also deals with nations. He deals with governments. He deals with people. And uh, he shows us in chapter 3 Nineveh's character and why they were done away with. Uh, just read a few verses. For instance, verse 1, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Lies and robbery were characteristic. Uh, verse 2 and 3, The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear 
And there's a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there's none end of their corpuses, uh, corpses, corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Uh, violence was just a characteristic of, of their nation. Verse 4, witchcraft. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her, her witchcraft. Behold, I'm against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, in verse 5, he goes on and talks about their immorality. I will discover thy skirts upon thy face and will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdom thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee. He's just saying, uh, this was a nation that had just gone uh, beyond, beyond hope. Uh, their immorality, even their, their pride. And he brings it down to verse 8. He, comp he makes a comparison. He says, uh, art thou better than populous no? <laughs> now no is that we know of that as an Egyptian city called Thebes. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, but he's just saying with Egypt, uh, he's saying to Nineveh, I judged Egypt. I judged the city of no. Uh, there's no reason I, I wouldn't judge you. In, um, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 2, he basically says to him, I ju I've judged Judah. I've judged my own people. I'm going to judge you. And it comes down to just the fact that uh, this is the end for Nineveh. Chapter 3, verse 14. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. But what he's saying to them is, you can make whatever preparations you want. It's not going to help. You can make bricks, you can gather water. Uh, I'm still going to burn you, I'm still going to break you. Uh, in verse 18, he just basically says they're going to be completely gone. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There's no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of thee, that's a word means report, shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. He says, when you're gone, all your neighbors are going to say, Yay! <laughs> no more Assyrians to attack us. Uh, so what he's saying is, you're going to get what you've deserved. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, what was it? The, they used to say, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And uh, that's what happened to, uh, to Nineveh. This is what you call apostasy. Apostasy is when you know the truth and you leave it. Apostasy brings judgment. God always rewards apostasy with catastrophe. God had sent his prophet. Jonah had preached. They had repented. But then as time went by, they just decided, uh, we'll just leave that behind. Oh, Grandpa talks about that revival, but we don't need that. And uh, you know, the thing we need to, to stop and think of is uh, you can see modern Christian nations in this book. You know, we're, we're seeing around the world places that used to have a regard for the Bible and for morality and so on are just leaving it behind. And we're seeing it here in Australia and uh, many places. Europe has gone through that. Uh, the question that I'd like you to, to think about is, how do we see comfort in this book? <laughs> uh, there is some comfort. One is, when you're on God's side, his vengeance on sin is a comfort. You know, to know that God will keep his word for, for good and for evil, you know, for rewarding righteousness and judging sin. Uh, you see that here. Uh, to me, one of the clearest statements on, on this is 2 Thessalonians 1. I'm just about done here. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. He says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's just saying, you know, living for the Lord now can be kind of, it can be tough. People of, of, Jesus, of, of the Bible days uh, 
often were put to death, you know, for, for trusting Christ. He's saying, there's coming a day when I'll, I'll deal with all of that. You know, there, there's comfort in knowing that God will reward our, our belief, our faithfulness, and God will judge uh, those who stand against him. Now, it's not comfort in knowing they'll, they'll get theirs, but it's just knowing uh, that God will, will do what's right. As well, I think there's comfort in the book of Nahum in knowing God's character. You know, when, you, when you see God's character, you see God is always going to do right. We may not understand it at the time. Uh, you know, for Assyria, I guess all they saw was they got destroyed. But what God saw was he'd given them 150 years to, to do what was right. He'd sent his prophet. They'd, they'd started doing right, and then they'd turned away. Before that, he'd given them several hundred years uh, to, to turn to him. Uh, we see God's character, and we know that God will do what's right. Abraham put it this way, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> and the answer is yes. We can know that God will, will do right. And as uh, modern-day Christians, uh, we need to realize uh, our nation may turn away from the Lord, but that doesn't mean that we have to. And, uh, I mean, it could happen where we'll suffer for believing what the Bible says and teaching what the Bible says. It could happen. It could happen in our lifetime. But we know that God will do what's right, and our, and our trust is in him. Uh, Paul went through that, ended up in prison uh, for serving the Lord, died in prison because of his, his stand for God. Uh, but there's, there's comfort in knowing that God will, will re reward uh, those who believe him, those that are faithful. Book of Nahum, not a very cheerful book. It, it's the, what's the second part of something? Uh, anyway, the, the next part of, of the, the story from Jonah. And uh, not, not a very good end, but a blessing to see what, what God is doing. In uh, Nahum 1, verse 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. You know, the Lord has, has blessing for us, and he has peace for us. Any questions or comments for